Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your anointing which teaches us all things. God, we know that we have no need of a teacher. We don't need a man or a woman, the young or the old, the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine. Come and teach us anything, God. We have your Holy Spirit that opens the eyes of our understanding, God, that we can be enlightened and understand your word, that we can understand how life works because of who you are and because of what you've done and how you want us to live life. And so, Father, we praise you and thank you for a move of your spirit in our hearts and in our lives tonight as the word is sown into our hearts. We open up our eyes, our ears, God. We, we prepare ourselves, Lord. God, we know that we're going to do our part giving our interest and our attention. And Father, we know that you'll do your part. Holy Spirit, welcome. Come and teach us, encourage us, strengthen us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you've called us to be and to do all that you've called us to do. Truly, God, you are the teacher of the church, and we thank you, Lord, that you bless us with your presence and with your power tonight, God. We don't just ask this blessing on ourselves, also we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel. We bless them, Lord, as you would bless us. Bless our Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatic, Pentecostals, brothers and sisters. God, we thank you for Calvary Chapel, for Harvest, for Oak Valley, for Ecclesia and Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist, the Way, God, for Victory and the Four Square Denominations, God, and the Assemblies of God. We thank you, Lord, that You bless our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters, all those that are preaching the gospel, Lord. We bless them as you would bless us. And God, also, we just lift up to you the nation of Turkey, God, as they've gone through a horrific attack, God. This is going on all over the world. And Father God, we pray for your peace. We pray for your protection, God. We pray for the salvation of these individuals that are going out doing these terrible things, God. We pray, Lord God, that you would send the gospel to the nations, Lord. That Jesus is the only answer, Father God. And so we thank you, Lord, that you protect and preserve lives, God, and that beyond that, Lord God, that you bring eternal life to those who are in darkness and who are lost, God. We just pray for these precious people, God, that you send comfort and strength. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, Amen. Amen. Tonight, get your Bibles out and go with me to the Word of God in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to get there eventually. Uh, we've got a couple other scriptures, but uh, maybe you don't have the same translation. And, uh, you know, oftentimes we study from the old King James, we preach and teach from the new King James, and, uh, and try and get it because it takes out the these and the thous, and it's a little bit easier for us to understand. Tonight, I've got a great little subject I want to talk to you about called Planting the Seeds of Tomorrow. You know, going through this process with Freedom for Our Future and concluding the process, we talked a lot about seeds that we sow. It kind of got me thinking because all of us want a certain outcome in our life. I think all of us could say that we want to be blessed in life. All of us could say we want to succeed in life. All of us could say that we want to have good things going on in our lives. And the seeds that we sow today, we're going to reap tomorrow in greater measure. See, because whatever you sow, you sow one seed, but you don't get one seed back. Is that right? You sow one apple seed. What are you going to get? You're going to get an apple tree that produces multiple apples that eventually will produce multiple seeds. Is that correct? And in the same way in our life, the seeds that we sow today, we are going to reap tomorrow in greater measure. That means it's very important what we sow, right? We we learn this, that if we sow to the flesh, of the flesh we will reap corruption, In other words, we could sow little bad seeds along the way, and we're not going to reap one little bad seed here and one little bad seed there. No, we're going to reap corruption in the flesh. The Bible says those who sow the wind will reap the whirlwind. In other words, you sow a little bit of wind, and all of a sudden here comes this great big wind. But if you sow good seeds along the road and along the way, then you're going to reap that goodness, and the Bible says eternal life. That's greater measure, isn't it? And so it's very important for us as we sow seeds to understand that we're going to reap those things tomorrow in greater measure. What we are experiencing today is a result of our decisions yesterday. So you didn't just happen to come to this place in your life. There were choices that you made. There were things that you decided to sow, words that you spoke, decisions that you made. Things that you decided to do or to not do. And in making those decisions, you were sowing seeds. And so who you are today is a result of the choices that you made in yesterday and the environment that you're in. We're going to talk about environment. We're going to talk about our decisions. There was a man in the Bible in the book of Genesis by the name of Jacob. Jacob was the grandson of the patriarch Abraham. He was also the son of Isaac. Now you would think... 
Here's Abraham, this great father of faith. Now, Abraham didn't always make the right decisions. You can see some things that he did in the Bible that he probably should have done a different way or done a different thing. But overall, when you look at Abraham's life, you say, wow, look at this man of faith. Look at this great man who, who was able to be the, the one who brought in and inaugurated faith, who God spoke to so much, who God led out of the, the, the land of his fathers and, and just kind of started this new lineage that started something that's just great and mighty, that eventually Jesus would come from his lineage. Then you see Isaac. Not much is said about Isaac. Kind of a quiet guy in the Bible. And yet, even though once again we see some things that Isaac did that we say, well, he probably should have done something different. In fact, he made some of the same mistakes his father made if you really study it out. But Isaac, you know, you see some great things in Isaac too, and you see this great man, you see the attitude of faith that's there, and in fact, the Bible says that God is the fear of Isaac. Wow, that's pretty neat. So here's the faith of Abraham, the fear of Isaac, and then comes this guy by the name of Jacob. Now, Jacob was a twin, right? Jacob came out second, and Jacob just couldn't stay second. Jacob was kind of a rascal. Jacob actually was holding on to his brother Esau's foot as he came out of the womb, and that's why he got the name Jacob, because they said he's a supplanter. He, he's one who holds on to the heel. In other words, you thought that you were in this place, and then here comes Jacob grabbing your foot and trying to move you out of that position. That's the kind of guy Jacob was, and we see that throughout his lifetime. He, he's led by his mom to deceive his dad and steal the blessing from his brother. In fact, one day his brother's all tired and wanting some food, and, it, and Jacob happened to be cooking that day, and so his brother says, give me some of that food, and Jacob's not sharing, so his brother says, I'm going to die. And Jacob says, give me your birthright. His brother says, what's it to me if I die? Go ahead and take it. Give me some soup, right? And so he sells his birthright for a bowl of lentils. Now, we find out later on that God did not really like that, because the Bible says, Jacob I love, but Esau I hate it. And we see that Esau, even though he sought that birthright later on, with tears, didn't find any place for repentance. But Jacob was the one who went after the blessings. Jacob was the one who, who went after that place. And that's why God liked this guy, Jacob, was because of the heart that was behind it. And yet Jacob sowed seeds in his life that he came to a point where he had to flee from his brother because his brother was so angry that not only did he steal his birthright, he stole his blessing. And Jacob flees from his brother because his brother says, I'm going to kill him after dad's dead. He's done. I'm, I'm just going to slaughter that little twerp. And so Jacob's mom hears about this, and Jacob was a mama's boy, so Jacob's mom comes to him and says, you better get out of here. Go to my brother's house. Stay there for a little while until the heat of his anger dies down, then you can come back. So Jacob runs away, goes out to his uncle Laban's house, and there at his uncle Laban's house, Laban is just as deceptive if not more than Jacob was. Remember, the seeds that you sow, you will reap in greater measure. Jacob, here he is thinking he's working for one woman, comes to his wedding night, and the next morning he wakes up laying down next to another woman. And Laban says, well, it wouldn't be right for me to give you the younger daughter who you wanted to marry first, so I gave you the older daughter. Now you can work another seven years for the younger daughter. So he does because he's in love. And then eventually he, he wants to move on, he wants to move out, he's got all these children, and he decides he's going to take off, and in that place, he decides a, on, a, on a certain wage with Laban, and Laban says, okay, you know what, I'll take all the pure ones, you get all the spotted and striped ones, and, and, and that's how it's going to be. So Jacob starts doing some. remember, Jacob, he was crafty, and Jacob understood what he needed to do, but Jacob believed God. And Jacob had an encounter with God along the road when he was fleeing from his brother, and he said, God, if you, if you will keep me in this way that I'm going, and, and God, if, if you will do what you said you were going to do, then, then God, this is the house of God. This is the place where I've heard from you, Lord, and, and I will come back to this place safely, and I will give you a tithe of everything that you give me. And so here Jacob starts to see this coming to pass, and so what does he do? He starts putting the striped sticks in, in front of the, the, the water troughs as the animals come to drink, and as they mate there, then they, they're looking at these striped sticks. Now, the striped sticks didn't have any power in themselves. In fact, it wasn't because he was putting the striped sticks in front of the, the breeds that they started breeding striped animals that Jacob could take as his own. It was the faith behind the works that Jacob was doing that got the job done because God started to bless Jacob in that place. And so Jacob, here he comes, and now he's got, to, he's, he's got all of his family. He starts to take off. His, his uncle Laban catches up with him and says, what are you doing? You're taking everybody. These are all my people. These are all my stuff. Jacob says, you've changed my wages 10 times, and now here I am. And, and, and so he, he says, well, make a covenant with me. And he says, I won't harm you, and you won't harm me, and this place will stay right here, and we won't cross over to do each other harm. And so they make a covenant that they're not going to hurt each other, 
And so they part ways at that time. And it's on the way back that Jacob is about ready to encounter his brother Esau once again, that he sees that there's an opportunity for his brother to kill him, right? And so he parts his company into two companies, and he says, you know what, I, I'm going to send one in front and one behind. That way, if Esau attacks one, maybe the other will survive. And he sends everyone up on ahead, and he wrestles with God at a place called Peniel, the face of God. There, Jacob has an encounter with God that he's wrestling with God, and as he wrestles with God once again, he's striving for a blessing. Because at morning time, the angel of the Lord says, hey, leave me. Let me go. I've got to go because the day is about ready to break. And he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And so he blesses him there. And he asks him, what's your name? He says, why do you ask my name? And he says, but your name is now going to be changed from Jacob to Israel. And that's where we find the children of Israel. That's where they got that name from is because God, after this encounter, changed Jacob's name. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Because Jacob, we can see, sowed the wrong seed early in life, and he reaped that. But then partway through his life, when he had an encounter with God at Bethel, when he came to the house of God, and he had that encounter, that he started to sow the right seed moving forward. And as he did that, then towards the end of his life, you can see that Jacob reaped good things in his life. In other words, tonight you came into the house of God, And I believe that tonight you're going to have an encounter with God here in Bethel, the house of God. And God is going to speak things into your life tonight that if you will pay attention and if you will apply to your life, you can start sowing the right seed and you can get the right results for your life. Are you listening tonight? See, it doesn't matter the way that you grew up. Two people might have got together in a drunken one-night stand, and you came out of that experience. Could be that you don't know your daddy, or maybe you don't even know either of your parents. Could be that you were raised up in the wrong place, on the wrong side of town, with the wrong people surrounding you. You could have done more than you wanted to do and gone further than you wanted to go, and you could have been in the wrong place at the wrong time, and bad things could have been happening to you. But I'm here to tell you today, if you will listen for the voice of God, and if you will allow this God encounter tonight to change your life, you can start sowing seeds that will change your destiny forevermore. How did he do it? How did he do it? How did Jacob start to change? What started to turn? A couple of things. First thing that I want to point out to you, if we're going to plant the seeds of tomorrow, the right seeds, we got to have vision. Got to have vision. See, Jacob, it was when he was asleep and he started dreaming that he had a vision of a ladder that went up into heaven. And that was the place where God spoke to him over that ladder. See, tonight, I'm just a ladder holder for you guys, hoping that you can climb that ladder and get closer to God and listen for his voice. But you got to have a vision for your life. See, it isn't until you start to get a vision of what your life could be like from the Word of God that things can start to change. See, if you see yourself as a loser, if you see yourself as a down and outer, if you see yourself as an outsider, if you see yourself as a failure, broke down, busted, and disgusted, you will stay in that place. Why? Because you have no vision to go anywhere else. But if you see yourself with the eye of faith, how God sees you from his word, did you know that you are victorious already in Christ Jesus? Did you know that you are an overcomer? Did you know that you are more than a conqueror? That's how the Bible talks about you. Did you know that you are not just favored, but highly favored of the Lord? Did you know that you're loved? Did you know that you are the apple of his eye? See, when you start to see yourself with the vision that God sees you with, it starts to change the focus of your life. In fact, the Bible says in the, new, uh, I'm sorry, the old King James Version, in Proverbs chapter number 29, verse number 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Now, when I first read this verse, I was kind of thinking, that's kind of weird because they're talking about vision, but then they're talking about the law. What's the correlation? The correlation is this, is that the word of God is the law of the Lord. And so if we understand what the word of God has to say about our lives, and we keep that as our vision, 
If we keep this as the mirror that we focus our lives on and we look into this, that way we start to see ourselves and see what we're supposed to look like from the Word of God, even though I may not be there yet, I can see myself as an overcomer. Even though I may not be there yet, I can see myself prosperous. Even though I may not be there yet, I can see myself as healed and healthy and whole. Even though I may not be there yet, I can see myself as wiser than all of my teachers because the Spirit of the Lord God has instructed me. See, if you can see see yourself this way, then you can start to change the seeds that you're planting in life. But it starts with the vision of the word of the Lord. Lynn Anderson writes, about 350 years ago, a shipload of travelers landed on the northeast coast of America. The first year, they established a town site. The next year, they elected a town government. The third year, the town government planned to build a road just five miles westward into the wilderness. In the fourth year, the people tried to impeach their town government because they thought it was a waste of public funds to build a road five miles westward into the wilderness. Who needed to go there anyways? See, here was a people who had the vision to see 3,000 miles across an ocean and overcome great hardships to get there, but in just a few years, they were not able to even see five miles out of town. They had lost their pioneering vision. See, with a clear vision of what we can become in Christ, no ocean or difficulty is too great. Without it, we rarely move beyond our current boundaries. Some of you guys, when you first got saved, you crossed over an ocean to get where you're at right now. And then you got in church, and then you started to get a hold of the Word of God, and now God is pushing you in some areas. God is poking at some things in your life, and He's starting to get you out of this comfortable situation. He's stirring the nest, so to speak. It's time to grow up. It's no more time for milk. Now it's time for the meat. It's time for you to get moving on something. But because you can't see it yet, you say, five miles outside of this, I can't go there. But God's saying, I need you to get a vision. I need you to get uh, some insight. I need you to look past your current life and your current situation so that you can start to move forward with what I've called you to do and what I've called you to be. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you you guys turn there? You guys remember I told you that ages ago when I started preaching? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I want you to turn there with me in your Bibles because I want you to see this. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Take a look at verse number 7. Little verse, probably good for all of us. I would encourage you, memorize this verse. Look at what it says. For we walk by faith not by sight. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Anybody memorize it just right now? Let's try it. Close your Bible on your finger, right? For we walk by faith, not by sight. Let's try it again. Everybody try that. For we walk by faith, not by sight. See, what you see in the natural is I can't do it. What you see in the natural is not me. I'm not educated. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not nice enough. I'm not good enough. I wasn't born on the right side of the tracks, you know, born in San Bernardino. All we're known for is a terrorist attack. All we're known for is a place where people go to lose hope. All we're known for by the LA Times, LA is in a bad condition themselves, and yet they're talking about how bad San Bernardino is. What's that all about? And I'm from San Bernardino. I'm from Rialto. I'm from Colton. I'm from Bloomington. I mean, who even knows where that is on the map? And yet, we walk by faith. You see, you already forgot the verse. Let's try it again. For we walk by faith, not by sight. See, when you have faith, you say, wait, what's God say I can be? I can do that. What's God say I can do? I can do that. What's God say I can have? I can have that. Why? Because you see it with the eye of faith. Are you listening tonight? See, it takes faith to see a future that God wants for you. It takes faith to see a future that God wants for you. You just have to look past your current borders. Hello, come on somebody. This is good stuff tonight. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is good for you. Turn to that same neighbor and say, it's good for me too. I'll admit it. What did he have? First of all, he had Vision. Second thing that I see is the words that Jacob spoke. See, when Jacob had that encounter with God, he started to speak faith in response to the word of God. He said, God, if you're going to do all that for me, you'll keep me safe. Then when I come back, God, I'll give you a tithe of all, and this will be the house of God. 
God didn't call that place the house of God. Jacob named that place the house of God. Jacob started to speak things in faith, started to declare the word of God, started to use his words. And all throughout the Bible, you'll find that our mouths sow seeds. The question is, what have we been sowing with our mouths? Now, if we've got the wrong vision, then we will sow the wrong seed out of our mouth, right? If in your heart you view yourself as a failure, out of the abundance the heart speaks and you will say, I'm a failure. That's how it works. But if in your heart is, I'm a champion. I'm a victor, not a victim. If in your heart is, I'm everything God says I can be. Then what's going to come out of you? I can do it. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I have the grace of God. I have the ability of God. I have the wisdom of God. See, those things will pour forth from your mouth. Why? Because they're in your heart. So you get the right vision, then you start to sow the right seeds. Just yesterday, I was at an amusement park, and uh, I probably will never go back to this particular one again. Don't ask me which one, all right, because they'll be mad at me. But um, I was at this amusement park with my kids, and there were moments where we kind of had, we were in line, you know, and you're standing in those lines forever just to ride a stupid ride that lasts a minute. It's like, why did I wait an hour and a half for a minute-long ride that made me feel sick? I just don't know why we do that to ourselves. You know what I'm saying? Like, I would have had more fun staying at home than I would have had standing in an hour and a half line for a minute ride that made me feel sick. So anyways, there were times where we kind of had to back our children up in line because, honey, you don't want to hear what these people are talking about right now. You know what I mean? And there came a moment we had gotten, we rented a locker because we had our bags and all that kind of stuff. So we put them in a locker so we didn't have to take them with us. And so we went and we were getting all of our stuff out of the locker at the end of the day. In fact, we, it was the first time I looked at my wife. I said, we went to an amusement park with our children and we're home after dinner, and the, the, the sun is still out, it's still right, and it's not because, like, it's summertime, usually we, we will shut a place down, that's the type of people the Roths are, you know what I'm saying, we like to have some fun, and we're going to get every minute we can out of that fun, so we're the guys that are there late, you know, hanging out, talking, chopping it up, so here we are, and we're home, because we, had, we just didn't like the experience, but here we are at the locker, we're getting our stuff out, and we're leaving early, and as we're leaving, uh, there was a, a little guy over here, and he had something of his mommy's, and he accidentally dropped it on the ground, and you should have heard the slew of profanities that came out of this mom's mouth at this little guy. My wife, she was kind of like, hold me back right now, because you know what, I'm, I'm about ready to go off. And so she kind of had to separate herself because she knew if she said anything, you know, like, hey, don't talk to your son like that. You shouldn't be cussing at a little guy like that. It would have been, well, don't tell me how to parent, you know. And so she said, I could just feel a fist fight coming on, and I was not going there. I didn't want to see, you know, in the newspapers, pastor's wife at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center deck some lady for cussing at her kids. You know, that just doesn't look good in the San Bernardino sun. So, um... So she, she separated herself and just went to prayer, you know, and just prayed for the lady, prayed for the little guy. But think about this for a second. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about right now because you experienced this growing up. You heard these words all your life. You're stupid. You're ugly. How about this one? You will never amount to anything. You heard those things growing up. What happened? You grew up believing that. And there was a seed that was planted inside of your little heart that as you grew, that seed turned into a weed, right? And even though you're not an ugly person, you did ugly things. And even though you're not a stupid person, you did stupid things. And even though you, you have great potential, you didn't amount to anything. Why? Because you believed those things that were sown into you at a young age. See, if we can get the image of what God's Word has to say about us, and we can start to declare these things about our lives. Every day, when I read the Word, I ask God, God, please give me wisdom, give me understanding, give me knowledge, God. Give me prudence out of your Word. Teach me, God. And then afterwards, when I'm in my prayers, I pray this prayer. I say, I have the wisdom of God. I have the mind of Christ. I have the grace and the ability, the power of God. I have the Spirit of God living on the inside of me. I can do all things through Christ. I say this stuff over myself each and every day. Why? Because I'm sowing seeds into my own heart that as they go into my ear, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So I'm sowing the Word of God out of my mouth. I'm sowing the seed. You guys remember the parable of the sower we talked about with Pastor Jim a couple weeks back? What did he say? The sower sows the what? 
The seed, which is what in the interpretation? What is it? The Word. See, we can show everything else about ourselves. I'm an American. I'm from San Bernardino. I'm a loser, right? Some of us sound like that old Beck song. You remember that? Soy de un perdidor. I'm a loser, baby. Stop singing that stupid song. You're not a loser. You are a winner. Why? Because Jesus Christ won. And now you're in Jesus Christ. Start to declare it. Start to say it. Start to speak it. Let me show this to you in the word, James chapter 3. Turn there with me. James, the third chapter. Hallelujah. James chapter 3. You're not stupid. You're wiser than all of your teachers. You have the tongue of the learned. Your tongue is the pen of a ready writer. See, you can start to declare, greater is he that's living in me than he that is in the world. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I'm not a loser. I'm a winner. I'm an overcomer. And start to declare the word of God. If you're feeling sick in your body, start to declare and sow the seed. By his stripes I was healed. I can have every promise in the Bible. All who touch Jesus were healed. I'm reaching out by faith and I'm touching Jesus. Start to declare the word of God. Look at this. James chapter 3 verse number 2 says, For we all stumble in many things. We all know that. Okay? We all mess up. We all screw up. We all stumble in many things. Look at this. If anyone does not stumble in what? Word. He is a perfect man or a completely equipped person. That's really what that perfect is talking about. Talking about complete. Talking about equipped. He is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. This is good news for you and me. You know why? Because our body wants to do stuff that our mind doesn't want to do. But when we get in our heart in our spirit, the word of God, and we get a vision of how we can be, when the body wants to do something that we know is wrong, then we can use the words of our mouth to steer ourselves in the right direction. Let me show this to you, okay? Able to bridle the whole body. Verse 3, indeed we put bits into the horse's mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. So here, think about a horse. You ever seen a horse's muscles? Those things are meaty, right? Those things are awesome. They're, they're, they're just gorgeous. And yet this big, massive horse, you can steer the whole horse, all the muscle, you can make it gallop, you can make it stop, you can make it go right, you can make it go left. They can make horses back up and dance, do the moonwalk like Michael Jackson. Why? Because they have a little thing about this big that they put in the horse's mouth called a bit. All they got to do is tug at that thing, the horse's mouth, Right? See, you are built strong. You are built to do great and mighty wonderful things, and yet your body's going to want to do its own thing. But if you can start to declare the Word of God, you can start to turn your life in the direction that God has for you. Now, if that wasn't enough, there's another verse I want to read to you. The very next verse, look at this. Verse number four, look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder. Wherever the pilot desires. Your tongue is a little teeny tiny member of your body. And yet, if they can turn a ship, think about those big old freighters, right? How big is the rudder in comparison to that freighter? Here's the freighter. Here's the rudder. That's it. That's all they have. And even though that thing's powered by diesel engines and big old propellers and all this kind of stuff, and it can go cruise and all that... All it takes is this little teeny tiny thing at the back to turn that entire ship. See, we think, wait, you're saying speak it and it'll start happening? That doesn't sound like anything. It doesn't sound that significant. And yet, your tongue can turn the course of your life. You just have to start to get a vision of the Word of God deep in your spirit and start to declare the Word of God out of your mouth in faith and watch God turn your life around. Last thing that we see in Jacob's life, not only was he a man of vision, not only did he get the vision of God, did he get a vision of his life from the Word of God, not only did he start to speak things, but his actions followed it up. He started to act differently. And even though he was wronged, he was, started to sow the right seeds. See, our deeds are seeds. What we do determines our destiny. And so as we start to declare and start to speak the word of God out of our mouth, and then we start to put legs to our faith, and we start to act like 
those things. Our decisions determine our destiny. Vance Havner said this. He said, the vision must be followed by the venture. It's not enough to stare up the steps. We must step up the stairs. See, when you get a vision of what God has for your life, when you start to see the victory that you can have in Jesus Christ, you know, and, and this applies to everywhere. You want to lose weight? Get a hold of the Word of God about it. You, you want to stop smoking? Get a hold of the Word of God about it. You want to start being a wise steward and making money and start prospering? Get the Word of God about it. You want to have great kids growing up? Get the Word of God about it. You want to have a great marriage? Get the Word of God about it. You want to be a businessman or woman? You want to start to do great and mighty things? You want to go out there and tell someone about Jesus and and, and take the passion and the fire that's burning on the inside of you to the nations? Get the Word of God about it. Get a vision of that in your heart. Start to speak it out of your mouth and then start to back it up with your life. It's not enough to stare at the steps. We've got to step up the stairs. Hosea chapter 10 verse 12. Look at what it says. I'll put it up on the overheads. It says, Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. See, fallow ground is hard ground that hasn't been cultivated. We need to start plowing that. And you can plow through that with your tongue, and then you can start sowing the seeds. Now look at what it says. For it's time to seek the Lord till He comes and rains righteousness on you. Now very interesting, okay? Up on the overheads, look at this. At the beginning and at the end of the verse, there's a word that I've highlighted. It's the same word. You sow for yourselves righteousness, then God's going to come and rain righteousness on you. What you sow, you will also reap. In other words, the righteous actions that you start to sow, the deeds that you start to do, what does righteous mean? That's the right wisdom of God, the right way of God. Not only position, but also a practice. As you start to do God's word, God's word will start happening to you. Are you listening? So you sow righteousness you will reap righteousness. God will rain it down on you. I've heard it said that life is the sum of our choices. Tonight, you may have come in and said, you know what, my life's a mess. I'm looking for an answer. You found one. His name is Jesus. And tonight, hopefully, you've gotten a vision that's different than your current situation, that's different than your past. doesn't matter what your mommy and your daddy and your uncle and the sergeant in the army and everybody else has said, maybe your friends in high school had spoken over you. does not matter what they said about you. It matters what God says about you. And as you get a vision of that in your heart and you start to speak the word of God and declare it out of your mouth and then you start backing it up with your life, your life will change. Last verse for tonight. I want to read this to you in Psalm 126. Turn there with me. Right in the middle of your Bible, you'll find the Psalms. Psalm 126. Psalm 126, verse number 5 and 6. Look at what it says. It says, those who sow in tears. Sometimes it's hard to sow. Sometimes you're not going to feel like saying who you are in Christ. Because you're going to feel like a loser. You're going to mess up and you're going to say, I don't deserve to be called an overcomer. Because I just failed. Sometimes you're not going to want to say, I'm healed, because you're going to be feeling so terrible in your body. Sometimes you're not going to want to go out and do the right thing, because the wrong thing feels so much better. And yet, those who sow in tears, in other words, those who go out and do what they need to do, regardless of how it feels, look at what it says, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. There will come a day where the seeds that you have sown in tears will come to you and you will be happy that you made the right choice. Remember where there's no vision that people perish, but happy is he who keeps the law of the Lord. Look at the next verse, verse number six. Verse six says, he who continually goes forth weeping. Now, I don't like this. Okay, I'm just letting you know this. If I would have wrote this, I would have said, he who weeped once. You know, that's enough, God. I don't want to weep a lot. And yet, this is not just a one-time thing. This means this is something that you have to consistently do throughout your lifetime. He who continually goes 
out weeping. If you don't give up, if you stay after it, if you keep the vision before you, keep it in front of you, get that striped stick, that speckled stick, and you start to put it in front of you whenever you drink of the word of God, then you will start to speak it, you will start to declare it, then you will start to live it, and as you sow that, see, he who continually goes out with weeping, bearing seed for sowing. In other words, you are strategic. This is on purpose. This is not just happenstance. This isn't just because, you know, you got close to the preacher and he spit on you and the the fairy dust of the word came. No, it's because I said, I want this and I'm going to have it in my life. I can see what God says about me. I have the vision of God and you put it in front of you and you declare it and you declare it and you declare it and you declare it. Then you do it and you do it and you do it and you do it. He who goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. In other words, there's going to be an abundance because what you sow, you will reap in greater measure. When Jacob was dead and gone off the earth, God called himself the God of Jacob. But did you know that God is also the God of Susan, the God of Stephen, the God of Aaron, the God of Daisy, the God of Dolores, the God of James and John. God is your God. God is a God who speaks those things that be not as if they were. What does God say about your life? You're not a loser. You're not a failure. You are not less than because greater is he that lives in me than he that's in the world. Get a vision of it. Start to declare it. Start to do it. Did you guys get the word of the Lord tonight? Come on, give God a praise. Hallelujah. God good. Now, I want to ask you guys, please remain seated at this time. Everybody sit down. Come on, this is not time to get up and leave, all right? So rude when we get up on the Holy Spirit. God's trying to speak something. I want you guys just to remain seated. Listen, there's not going to be a traffic jam outside. We'll get you out quickly. I want to talk to you about your life before you leave this place. Everything we just talked about works for people who are in a right relationship with Jesus Christ. And just by having positive thoughts or sitting in a church and calling yourself a Christian doesn't make you right with God. Doesn't get you on the right track. I want to make sure before you leave this place tonight that your heart's right with God. I want to make sure that if this was your last night on the earth, you know, the people in Istanbul, the people in Orlando, the people down the street here in San Bernardino thought that they had more time. And tonight you might have come in here not thinking about eternity. You might have been just thinking about today, thinking about how you're going to get through the next day. And yet I want to turn your focus from now to eternity. What if this was your last night on the earth? We're not guaranteed tomorrow. What if tonight was your last night? What if you got in your car and you turned on your car and your heart stopped and you died? Or what if while you were driving down the freeway, you had a chance encounter with a semi-truck and your life here on the earth stopped? You say, that's morbid, Pastor. Why would you start talking about death? Here's why. Because the Bible says there's more wisdom in the house of mourning than there is in the house of feasting. In other words, when we take a look at our lives and when we see the end of things, our hearts start to focus on the right things. We put priorities in the right place. And I want to make sure that your eternity is secure with God. See, there's only one or two places you're going to end up. You're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. Can't come back as a frog or a dog or work your way up back again until you get it right. There's no second chances when it comes to this because the Bible says it's appointed for man once to die and then to the judgment. And our lives will go before the Lord and God will judge us according to what we did while we were here in the body whether good or evil. And what's going to make the difference when it comes to our sin is what we did with Jesus. Sometimes people think that all they have to do to be right with God is go to church. But you know that nowhere in the Bible says just go to church, that makes you a Christian. It's like me saying, I really want to be an automobile. I'd like to be a car. And I think that I'm going to go into my garage, call myself a car, and that's going to make me a car. Nope, just dude crazy sitting in his garage calling himself a car. Not going to work. In the same way, you can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. 
Sometimes people think all roads lead to heaven because Jesus went to the cross that now it's wide, it's open, it's expansive. Everybody gets to go in. You do whatever you want to do, I'll do what I want to do. The church is out there, they can do their thing. You know, it's all good with God. He's going to let everybody in. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible say God's going to let everybody in? Otherwise, why would the Bible talk about hell? It's a very real place. Jesus even talked about it. And all roads do not lead to heaven. In fact, the Bible doesn't define the way of heaven as being expansive and wide. Isn't that weird? We would think it would be wide and open and expansive. But Jesus said the road is narrow and the gate is small and there are few who find it. Tonight, can I, can I shine some light on the road for you? Can I light up the path for you? Because we can't get there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. Not all roads lead to heaven any more than all roads here on the earth lead to the moon. You're going to have to get there one way, and that's God's way. And Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. Now, we in America, we, we get a picture of crazy, radical, weirdo, goofy stuff because we've seen movies with born-again people. We've read blogs on the internet about born-again people, and we really don't want to have any part of that. Well, I don't blame you if it was that. But listen, let's not let the world define for us what being born again is. Let's let the Bible do that for us. What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus Christ. You can't attend enough church. You can't do enough good works. You can't volunteer enough at church. You can't be raised in a Christian home and that gets you right. You must be born again giving God all of your heart, and giving God all of your life. The last book of the Bible, Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. Jesus says, when I come, I want to find you hot, or I want to find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Now, what is he saying, lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down, little token prayer every now and again, and occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do just what we're talking about, to be born again. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. Will you give God all of your heart? Give God all of your life, being born again, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell? Or will you sit there and do nothing? when you know you need to get right with God. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to be born again. I want to give God all my heart, give God all my life. I want to be headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You might be thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. You might be. But let's get over that tonight. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Moment of possible embarrassment for eternity away from God? Come on. And yet the devil thinks that you're so dumb, he's trying to talk you out of this right now. Remember, you're not dumb. You're not stupid. You have the wisdom of God as shown to you in the Word of God. You must be born again now. Will you act on that wisdom? And listen, you might be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell. So tonight, who should raise their hand? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Tonight is your night, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this before? Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? Come on, stop playing games with God. Let's go wholehearted for Jesus tonight. All across the auditorium, back in the family rooms, I can see you guys wherever you're at in the foyer, down at the Love Rock Cafe. Come on, get ready, get your hand up, and then tell an usher or come into the church service right afterwards. If you're watching online across the nation and around the world, you need to do this. Come on, you know you need to. Get ready to get your hand up, and then I'll give you some further instructions a little bit later. Come on, this is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Get ready to get your hands up on the count of three if you need to do it. Here we go. One, two, three. Three, let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. There's one, two, three, thank you, four, five, thank you. Who else tonight? There's five wise people already on this side. There's five wise people already on this side. There's six. Where are you at, number six? Thank you, six. Got you right there. God bless you. Who else that I did not already see? Anybody else that I did not already see? Need to give God all your heart. Need to give God all of your life. 
There's six wise people already, and I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Anybody else real quick? You need to give God all of your heart and need to give God all of your life. Anybody else? Where you at? If that's you. Pointing over here. I'm not seeing anybody. Else. Oh, I already got you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Thank you. God bless you. you can put your hand down. Anybody else that I didn't already see? All right. Praise God. Thanks for making sure tonight. Anybody else? I don't want to miss you. Listen, you missed enough opportunities in your life. Don't miss this one. If God's tugging at your heartstrings, you can feel that tug right now. Maybe your heart's beating out of your chest. You're wondering, is he talking to me? Yeah, I am. I'm talking to you. Come on, let's go for God tonight. Anybody else real quick? Come on. That's you. And I'm looking in your direction. Just raise your hand up high. Anybody else? Anybody back in that family room that I didn't already see? Anybody over here on this side? Here in the middle, anybody else? Anybody on this side over here? Thank you. Number seven, God bless you. Anybody else real quick? Let's go for God tonight. All right, let's give the Lord a hand for seven wise people. Amen. All seven of you, number eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. You should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Listen, you made that decision tonight to follow Jesus, say yes to Jesus, giving him all of your heart and all of your life, then any decision requires action, okay? Tonight, you already heard the word. Now it's time to put some legs to your faith. Let's believe God. You got a vision of seeing yourself born again. Now, come on. We're going to pray together. Let's all stand. And if you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front right now. Even if you didn't raise your hand, but you need to. Come on right now. Come on down. Jesus, I believe in you. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. Jesus, I belong to from the family rooms, if you want to bring your children, they're welcome at this time. From the foyer, come on in. If you raise your hand, come on down right now. They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. Even if you didn't raise your hand, this is your time. This is your moment. Come on down. All right, I got five up here. I had seven hands, and I have been known to be a bad counter, all right? But I know better. Some of you guys raised your hand. You didn't come. They're still coming. That's all right. Come on. And, and if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, I'm going to have my friend Elijah sing that song one more time. And just check, check your heart out right now. Sow the right seeds. Because your future depends on it. And your eternal destiny is at stake. Listen, I don't want to sound fatalistic, but listen, one good earthquake, we gone, right? We had a guy come to this church and he resisted the altar call and resisted the altar call and resisted the altar call. And you wonder why we push this stuff so hard. You wonder why we're so in your face and spend like, I spent like 15 minutes giving an altar call tonight. You want to know why we do that? I had a guy, he wrote us a letter from prison. That should be your first indicator this is serious. And he said, I sat in your church, I heard your altar call, and I didn't go forward. He says, I was there with the woman that I loved. That night, I got into a gang fight, got into a shootout with the police, and now I'm sitting in a prison, away from the woman I love. And he says, now I'm a Christian, now I gave my heart to the Lord, but I can't go to church. I don't have the freedoms that I had, and I can't be with the woman that I love. See, his choice is brought him to the wrong place because he sowed the wrong seed. Tonight, God is asking you to step out, to get in the aisle, and to come up front and give your heart to the Lord Jesus because you don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't know what tonight holds. And I just feel compelled to the Lord to give you this opportunity one more time. So Elijah, will you sing that song one more time? And if you need to come, if you know God's speaking to you right now, don't wait another minute. Get down here right now. Come on, come on. Come on down. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I breathe. Jesus, I believe. All right.
Hey, everybody up front, you guys came. Praise God. We're so glad, so excited for your new life in Jesus Christ. Okay, going to be born again, brand new on the inside. Right over here to my right, your left, this is Dr. Becker waving and smiling at you. Really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? You already got past me. I'm about as weird as you're going to get tonight. Okay, he's cool. Now, he does have a little bit of an accent. He's from South Africa. All right? I have to say it like that because that's how the South Africans say it. So you're going to hear him talk a little bit, okay? So he's a really good guy. Nothing weird is going to go on. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in your heart. You're going to be born again. He's going to give you some free information, some free literature. Find out what to do next in your walk with God. Now that you're a Christian, what do you do next? Okay? He'll give that information to you absolutely free. And then he'll introduce you to one of the wonderful people in our church that we call a spiritual personal trainer. Basically, it's someone in church who will come alongside you and encourage you in the things of God. Speak the word of God. Teach you the word of God. So you get a vision of who you are in Christ now, like we talked about. So you can start to live that life and start to sow the right seed as you start your new walk with Jesus Christ. Then he'll let you come right back out, okay? Your friends and family will wait for you. If you guys will just make a left turn, follow Dr. Becker right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Love you, Dr. B.